Now, at this point, you could certainly be forgiven for wondering how the alarmists even try to sustain their case, given all the evidence we have seen that recent climatic changes are not even unusual, let alone unprecedented, that they are the continuation of trends going far back into the past that we know were not the responsibility of human beings, and that a warmer Earth has not been hostile either to human civilization or to plants and animals. And I'm afraid the answer here is not very pretty. They do it by mixing in roughly equal measures, ignorance of what has gone before, and exaggeration of what is happening now. And occasionally, a bullying wish that they could jail people who don't accept their prescriptions immediately. Without paying much attention, even to evidence from the 20th century, they attempt to claim that we are clearly in danger of, in Prince Charles's words, disastrously breaching nature's boundaries. They claim that both temperature and CO2 are well outside what has been normal for the past few thousand years, and they insist that we are experiencing a disastrous epidemic of extreme weather that is only going to get worse. That clearly shows that we have destroyed the delicate balance of nature. Together we are fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. In a book prepared for the 1972 UN Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm, Sweden, environmentalists Barbara Ward and René Dubot wrote, quote, We encounter another fact about our planetary life, the fragility of the balances through which the natural world that we know survives. In the field of climate, the sun's radiations, the Earth's emissions, the universal influence of the oceans, and the impact of the ice are unquestionably vast and beyond any direct influence on the part of man. But the balance between incoming and outgoing radiation, the interplay of forces which preserves the average global level of temperature, appear to be so even, so precise, that only the slightest shift in the energy balance could disrupt the whole system. It takes only the smallest movement at its fulcrum to swing a seesaw out of the horizontal. It may require only a very small percentage of change in the planet's balance of energy to modify average temperatures by 2 degrees centigrade. Downward, this is another ice age. Upward, a return to an ice-free age. In either case, the effects are global and catastrophic." End quote. MSNBC, on September 24, 2009, wrote, We are on the verge of pushing nature into a state of instability like nothing humanity has seen before, according to a study published in the journal Nature. It's as if humanity is driving a car on top of a mesa with the lights off, said University of Minnesota climatologist and ecologist Jonathan Foley. Stepping on the gas in any direction will send us off a cliff. Now, clearly, it will not do to dwell on evidence of enormous variability in the Earth's climate, including its temperature, if you're trying to convince people that the environment is like some precious vase, beautiful but fragile, and if we carelessly elbow it off the table, it will smash and be impossible to repair. And indeed, the environment would have to be extremely fragile if the trivial increase in carbon dioxide in the last hundred years could really throw it irretrievably out of balance. We've seen CO2 in the atmosphere rise from about 290 parts per million to 400. You can't see either slice on this graph because carbon dioxide share of the total atmosphere has risen in this period by 0.011%. But in fact, environmentalists do not believe that nature is brittle. Do they? Don't take my word for it. Here's what the Prince of Wales writes in his little book on climate change. Our planet and its ecosystems run through cycles and loops, for example, the water cycle and carbon cycle. Soils break down plant remains and turn them into the nutrients needed to grow new plants. As is common sense, everything is recycled and reused. In nature, there is no waste. If he's right about that, then nature is not going to turn up its nose at an increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. It is going to use it to grow more plants. And as a matter of fact, there is compelling evidence that the so-called green revolution was partly due to ingenious crossbreeding, but it seems also to have been due to there being more carbon dioxide available for plants. CO2, uh is very important for water economy. We talked about the stomata in plant leaves that you use for dating, for, for, uh, for figuring out uh, what was past CO2 levels. 
Well, when there are lots of holes, uh, water is leaking through the leaf like a sieve. And so plants then cannot grow in arid regions. They can't grow at high altitudes. So when you look down with satellites today, you can see the whole earth is getting greener, especially the arid regions of the earth. And that's because plants are now growing in regions that used to be too dry for them to survive. Millions of people in the third world are alive today because of increased atmospheric CO2, because Prince Charles is right when he lets down his guard and says, in nature, there is no waste. But that's not the global warming orthodoxy. 